<clears throat> well, good morning. It is Tuesday morning. I think it's uh, day 22, if I'm not mistaken, of the uh, shelter in place as we're still in the midst of this coronavirus. And if you're like me, you are ready to get back to normal. Hey, Tammy. Good morning, Jenny. Um, good morning, Brenda. Good to see you. Vonda, hello. Uh, Mark, good to see you. Um, but here we are in the midst of, of this, and uh, we're coming into Easter weekend and still looking at the events in Jesus' life leading up to the crucifixion. Yesterday, um, we had seen that Saturday before the, the Sabbath where Jesus had been anointed in Bethany by uh, Mary, and we had seen that the safest place to be is is with the one who has uh, the means to raise the dead. My wife just texted me and asked me if I am on yet. Uh, somebody text her, please, and let her know, yes, I am. I can't text her right now. Um, but today, we're, we're going to continue uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday's events, which, which would have been Sunday if we'd actually looked at it, Palm Sunday. We see his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and they're waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna, uh, declaring uh, that uh, he um, was the one that they were welcoming and believed was probably the Messiah. And then we're really picking up on Monday of, of those week's events today as we look in Mark chapter 11. Uh, you can take your Bibles and turn there, Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 15, as Jesus uh, is going up to the Temple Mount there, leading up to Passover. And we read in Mark's Gospel, this, this is not recorded uh, for us in Matthew, but we read in Mark's Gospel, um, after he had walked by the fig tree and cursed it, we're going to look at that tomorrow as we see uh, what it meant when Jesus cursed the fig tree. But here he's going up to the Temple Mount. Mark records for us in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written? And here he's quoting Isaiah 56. He says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Now here we see in the life of ministry of Jesus, this is actually the second time that he cleansed the temple. There's some debate over whether or not it was one or two, but I, I personally believe that chronologically as we look at the life of Jesus, John records for us in his gospel in John chapter 2, the first time that Jesus cleansed the temple. And this would have been about two years before this time now. And Jesus had gone there during the Passover, as recorded in John chapter 2, and he had recognized that what God had established, the, the temple, began as the tabernacle in the wilderness. It was that place where God would meet with his people, would dwell among his people, and God had called Israel out by his election to be his chosen people, whereby he would dwell in their midst and he would be their God, and it was uh, the tabernacle was constructed there in the wilderness as a place where God would literally dwell among his people. And it was uh, at that place where there, there was a courtyard where sacrifices would be made uh, to God, animal sacrifices, the spilling of blood signifying that uh, apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And that was a foreshadow of, of what God would do to, to redeem lost man, where he would send his son Jesus to 
uh, be that sacrifice for them where our sins would be laid on him. He would suffer the wrath of God uh, in, in our place, what we deserved he would suffer. And he would shed his blood as a, as a permanent atonement, a payment for our sin. And he carried through the history of Israel when uh, they were in Jerusalem that the temple was built. And here we have what we just saw last year, those who went to Israel, uh, Herod's temple, where the large courtyard was there. And so Jesus comes into it and he, and he recognizes that the message that he had sent two years prior, which is recorded in John's gospel, that they had taken what God had intended, the place where he would dwell among his people, and they had turned it into a, a, a whole racket, a system where offerings were required to be made to God, but the priest and, and their cronies were, were selling animal, animals to be sacrificed, some that they would uh, take from others who would say that this one is not pure enough, it doesn't meet the standards to be sacrificed, and, and they would take that pigeon or whatever the animal would be, they would set it over to the side, and the next poor individual that came there to purchase a sacrifice to, to make, they would take the one that they had just turned away, and they would make a profit off of that. And, and Jesus was outraged that they had made what God had called to be a house of prayer into uh, a system that it was all about themselves. It was all for their profit and all for their benefit where they had done that. And so Jesus was indignant about that. And he um, overturned the tables. He, 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 in his wrath, in his anger, he, he took it out on them. The, the, the temple that was designed to be a place where God met with his people and his people met with him and sacrifices would be made for him. Uh, they had turned it into this. And it was from that they were, they were even more outraged at Jesus and, and sought even more to kill him. And what Jesus came and did was interrupted a religious system that they had established where God's intention was that he wanted to dwell among his people they had taken that and profited off of it. We're, we recognize and realize that today we, we no longer have the temple where sacrifices are made. Uh, but we realize that, that we ourselves are a temple, the temple of God, where he once dwelt among his people in a physical building and location. In the church now, we as believers, the Holy Spirit indwells each and every one of us. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians where he says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Now, we have to take pause at that for just a moment. Because if you're like me, oftentimes I'm not conscious of the reality that where God once dwelt in a physical building, a temple among his people, his intention now, in my life and in your life as those who are Christ followers who trust him that his temple his that our bodies are literally the temple of God where he dwells by the Holy Spirit Paul goes on to write he says you are not your own I I, I don't <laughs> I don't belong to me I I belong to him you belong to him you are not your own he says for you were bought with a price, a tremendous price that was paid where God purchased us for himself. Not only did he purchase us, but he dwells within us by the Holy Spirit. He says, therefore, glorify God in your body. Uh, now, if that doesn't cause you and me to pause for just a moment, it should that God dwells within us, each and every believer, the body of Christ, by his Holy Spirit. And this body of ours uh, doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to God. And he says, therefore, glorify God by your body. Paul also reminds us in the book of Romans, chapter 12, yeah, I want to turn there, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Romans chapter 12, 
verses 1 and 2, in that because we have been purchased by him and the Holy Spirit dwells in us, Paul reminds us or he appeals to us in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, I, I, I implore you, I beg of you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. When Paul uses the term there, our bodies, he means our whole being, not just our physical body, but our mind, our will, our emotions, everything that we are. He says, present all of who you are to God as a living sacrifice. That's kind of an oxymoron there, isn't it? A living sacrifice. Sacrifice in the sense that, that we're surrendering ourselves to him, but, but we are alive in him. And then he says that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So everything that we do in our bodies is an act of worship. The question is, is it acceptable by God or not? But he implores us to present our bodies holy and acceptable to him as a living sacrifice. And this is our spiritual worship. He goes on to say in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I've been reflecting on this Jesus cleansing the temple and calling, as Isaiah did, his house where he dwells shall be a place of prayer. Realizing that he no longer dwells in buildings, but he dwells in us. My, my prayer has been through this coronavirus and us as the body of Christ not being able to come together in a physical location to be able to worship him. I look forward to the day that we can do that again. But my prayer has been, God, change me through this so that I don't come back together with the body of Christ in that building to worship you. God, change me so that it's not about me, but it's all about you. You see, there where Jesus cleansed the temple, they had made it all about them and not about him. My prayer is that God would so change us that we would have such a hunger to be together as the body of Christ they would have no longer would it be a time of, of normality. No longer will it be a time where we come to, to see what, what benefit there is for us in it. No longer will we come to um, have the idea that we're going to critique how the music was. Boy, that's so fleshly when I do that. And it's fleshly when you do it too. No longer would it be a time that we come to see whether or not the, the presentation of the word uh, made us feel good or, or whether or not it was engaging or whether or not it was cutting edge or contemporary or whatever. But that we would come together uh, to this place that we call the church, but it's really a, a building where the church comes together and it would truly indeed become a place where we come together to cry out to God, to call on God, to worship him, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. No longer concerned about whether or not it was a, a, a old hymn or a contemporary song. Folks, it's not about us. It's about him. So I want to encourage you today as we're still in this situation, we don't know how long it'll be, but may God by his Holy Spirit work in us that we would be transformed and changed more to the likeness of Christ. And when we do get to come together again, may it be that we come together truly to worship him in spirit and in truth and he would look at us and say, boy, that's a house of prayer. God bless you. I love you. I want to pray for you before we close today. I want to ask you to continue to pray for me. 
Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm a little bit stir crazy and um, this is getting to me just a little bit. Um, I miss everybody and I'm, I'm just like you. I, I know we're all feeling the same thing. Um, but let's hold fast and let's take advantage of this opportunity to draw near to God. Father, we love you. Uh, God, we bless you. God, I pray that, uh, Lord, uh, you would continue to meet your body. God, as we're scattered at different locations, Lord, we recognize that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God, we pray that you'd use us wherever we are, God. Uh, Lord, in whatever way that you would want to use us to, to truly draw others to you uh, through our lives and our witness and our testimony. God, I pray that you would sustain the body. God, that you would encourage the body today. God, I pray that you'd lift up those who are downcast, God. I pray that, Lord, you would um, draw us near to you. God, I pray that you would meet the needs of those who within our body and uh, God outside of our body who maybe have lost jobs or employment. God, I pray that you would meet their needs according to your riches and glory. God, your word says that you have never seen the righteous begging for bread. And so, Father, we pray that you would protect our body, God. Again, we pray for those who are working in, in, in critical areas, God, our nurses, Lord. I, Think of Susan Payne, Lord, and others. Um, God, I pray for those who are uh, having to, to go and be in the public, Lord, because they have a vocation that necessitates that. God, I pray that you'd sustain them and keep them. God, as we go to the grocery store in our time of need, Lord, I pray that, God, you'd use us to encourage those that are working there. And God, not to criticize and not to complain. Father, may we be the body of Christ. God, move in us. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m.